All right, guys, bear with me here. I'm just getting back into recording my screen, audio, new programs, and stuff like that. So maybe problems with things. So bear with me. Let's start out with the Dow long-term weekly chart. So you can see way back here was 1987 crash. A little blip on the screen there. But one could argue that was the beginning of the current, one could argue the beginning of the current bull market was all the way back in 1985, but um, bulls and bears, one big bull, not sure, but let's zoom in. I want to concentrate on this period here, 2007. You notice I've drawn in the support levels. Now this support level from the 2000, basically before Trump was elected, this is the next support level. We, we've almost hit it. It's almost like we bounced off it. You can see it's sitting around, mm, we'll call it 18.5. We got close to it. Uh, go to the hourly. So about 500 points away from that support level. Next support level is all the way back at the top. And I, this is a period I want to look at, the top that we reached in 2007 before the financial crisis. I think this, I don't know what this is going to be called when this thing comes in full force. Maybe this is going to be called a hiccup. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, I want you to keep an eye on this because we're going to look at interest rates and then we're going to talk about stocks again. So here's the FinViz chart of the 10-year, the two-year, the five-year note. And, you know, the Fed's played with these over the years. They, you know how they work. They juggle things and jiggle things. And you can't really rely on historical data that well. But, I mean, it gives you a picture. This is, we're on the monthly. So you can see that the low in interest rates that was hit right after the election of Trump it's right here in this area. It's really most clearly marked here on, you know, the 30-year. It's a, it's on all of them, but it's it's really clear here on the five-year note. You can see Trump gets in and interest rates start rising. But then we have this turnaround in 2019 and interest rates start falling. Remember that interest rates are inverse to the price of bonds. I know uh, some new people don't know that, so... Just briefly, as the price of a bond rises, uh, the interest rate falls. And what that means is that existing bonds that yield higher rates are worth more. So if you're a bond investor, you're making money. The reason why you're making money when interest rates fall is because the bonds that you have have higher interest rates. So I want to take you to the yield curve and we're going to look at the year 2007. So that's the year that we were looking at, at that last top, right here. This is where we had the last top in the stock market. You can see the stock market went from about 14,000 on the Dow to roughly a little below, says it got cut in half. The Dow got cut in half here. And so back to the yield curve, the interest rates for the year of 2007, you can see we started off the year here. This is These are the one month, two month, three month, six month, one year, etc. And you can see there's a flat yield curve here. You see that 4.79% on the one month treasury? Same thing, you know, three month. The main ones to go by are the three month and the 10 year, but you can see it's a flat yield curve. Now we get near the end of the year, if you remember what happened in December, we started to see the cracks in the system. I think it was in December when a couple of Bear Stearns hedge funds blew up. But you can see here the pattern on most of them, the interest rates kind of reached a high at, at the beginning of the year. We were above 5%. About in February, March, you can see short-term rates were above 5%. And then things started to head downhill interest rate wise. And then near the end of the year, we're in May now, we're at four, 
we're dropping, we're about four and three quarters. We're back up to five in August, and we start to really kind of stutter here on the short, short end. Get down to three and a half, and then by the end of the year, uh, we're down below three. You can see 2.89 in December, and then you know what happened. Uh, basically, the beginning of 2008 and through the fall was a series of catastrophic uh, events. We had Bear Stearns go under with the silver uh, manipulation. It was it was all tied together, uh, but Bear Stearns had, was a silver short at the time. They got destroyed, in, and their hedge funds blew up, and the real estate blew up. Everything blew up. But the reason I'm showing this is because I want you to see just where we were. You know, before the crisis hit, we were basically at five percent across the board. Uh, so you could get, you know, 5% on a three-month, you know, so you could just go and buy yourself a three-month uh, T-bill, roll it over, and collect your 5%. So if you had 100 grand, you know, you, you could collect 5,000 from the federal government on that 100 grand. If you had a million, you could collect 50,000 a year tax-free, not state taxes, but federal taxes. So... If you had a couple million dollars, well, you're pretty much set. You could just, just live off the interest. Now, let's look at uh, today. Let's actually go to 2020. And you can see when we started the year, we were already pretty low, relatively speaking. I'm not going to go back and find the top in this current interest rate cycle. It definitely did not go as high. Rates did not go nearly as high as they did in the last one. And that's something that we see when we look at the long-term chart. It's just a series of stair steps down as the Fed is, is basically going out of existence. Or who knows what's going to happen. I don't know. But their, uh, their bazooka is getting weaker and weaker as they keep firing it. So you can see the beginning of the year, January, we had low rates. Definitely low rates, one and a half percent on the three month and two percent on the long bond. So not a flat yield curve, uh, not an inverted yield curve where rates are higher on the short end. So just a, a normal yield curve that's very low rates. Now let's go down here and take a look at what's happened. I don't know if you can see what I'm seeing, but I'm seeing like a little triangle forming right here. Do you see how zero is growing? Okay, just the beginning of March, we had one and a half percent. Where are we now? Fridays, March 20th, 0 0.04%, 0.05%, 0.05%, 0.05% on the six month. You get 0.05% on your money. So one year, you get 0.15%. You see how this thing is working its way all the way out to being a flat yield curve of zero? That's end game. We don't know what that's going to look like. But it's going to be ugly. It's definitely going to be ugly, and the Dow is not the ugliest. This is this. I don't think this is a Russell 2000. It's just the U.S. 2000. I couldn't find a Russell 2000 there, but it's roughly equivalent to the Russell 2000. And you can see this thing was cut in half, basically the high being 17.5, the low so far being almost cut in half. Uh, we're getting ready to take out the lows of 2016 and bounce right off the highs of that last crisis. So where uh, did we go in the Great Depression? We went down 90%. Where, where does that take us? Right about, let's draw it in. It takes us right here. That's where it takes us. What's going to happen to your retirement if we have the second Great Depression? Not a Great Recession, not this, a Great Depression. 
number two. Do we have tanks in the streets? I don't think so. We have tanks in the streets this time. We're going to go more than 90, 95. So I'll take you back to a video that I did nearly 10 years ago talking about silver. And we know that silver hasn't performed. We still haven't seen the cartel being broken up, so we don't know for sure what the price of silver will be. Maybe it will be even lower. Maybe a deflationary collapse will take the price of silver and gold to very, very low levels because there's just no demand. The economy's dead. Dead. I don't know. But I think what I said in this video back then applies just as much today uh, uh, as it did back then as far as where the paper is going to go. So let's listen to this together. I'm going to pause it and uh, comment. Hello, I just spoke to my financial advisor and she told me about the large amount of money I will have from investing when I retire. Really? And what are you investing in? My 401k. And what's in your 401k? Mutual funds, I guess. So notice the office noise in the background, all the people talking. Yeah, we're all working from home now. Those of us who can, those of us who can't, I don't know. You guess? You are guessing about your retirement? Well, I really don't know that much about investing. I see. So you really have no idea what you are doing or what you are investing in. But you know that you are going to retire fabulously wealthy? Yes. Congratulations. You are about as ignorant as 90% of the American people. So what's going to happen now? What, what are people going to do when they find out their 401k is down 30%? Are they going to sell? No, they're not going to sell. Are they going to sell when it's down 50%? Probably not, some. Are they going to sell when it's down 75%? No, then it's too late. Are they going to ride it all the way down 90, 95%? Probably. Some will bail at that point. Maybe when all of them bail, there'll be a, the bottom. Maybe there won't be a bottom. Uh, I think it was Jesse Livermore that said, uh, uh, dead bodies bounce, but don't, don't buy the bounce. Um, those bodies need to stay good and dead for a long time before they rise up. And Livermore, you know, if you know the history, Livermore committed suicide during the Great Depression. Because Livermore was a person who could make money in any market. It didn't matter. A uh, bull market, bear market, he could identify the market and he just used, he was the, the father of technical analysis. He just watched prices and make money. Not, not in the Great Depression though, he couldn't make any money. Prices were dead. They were flat. The bodies were just laying on the ground. Do you even know what a mutual fund is? Well, no, not really. It is an investment vehicle that combines the returns of various stocks and bonds. Do you know what stocks and bonds are? Well, no, not really. Stocks are pieces of paper which give you partial ownership and voting rights in publicly traded companies. And bonds are pieces of paper which represent the debt obligations of publicly traded companies. Well, is it better for me to own more stocks or should I own more bonds? Neither. You don't own either one of those. But I thought you said my 401k is invested in stocks and bonds. No. Your 401k is invested in mutual funds. I see. Well, aren't they the same thing? No. As I told you, mutual funds are pools of stocks and bonds. So you don't really own the debt or shares of any particular company. Do you know which mutual funds you own? So the point I'm trying to make here is that the money is rehypothecated multiple times. Y you own a mutual fund, but the mutual fund just owns shares of companies, stocks and bonds. 
And sometimes you own ETFs, which own mutual funds, which own stocks and bonds, which... So how many times can your money be rehypothecated? And how far away are you from your original investment? Basically, you what you own is a debt obligation. You own somebody else's IOU. Aggressive growth. That's not a fund. It's a type of fund. So you don't know what mutual funds you own? No. And you don't know what allocation of stocks and bonds they have in them? No. And you don't know the names of the companies whose stocks and bonds they hold? No. And you don't know who the fund manager is, who is deciding where to invest your money? No. I see. But you still think you are going to retire wealthy? The only thing you are going to do, is be fleeced by the criminals on Wall Street. But I have been told that mutual funds are the best way to invest for the long term. So how long exactly are you willing to wait? So, how many people have Google and Tesla and Facebook in their portfolios, not to mention Amazon and Netflix? And what about commercial real estate? What about the malls? What about the restaurant stocks? What about the overpriced retail stocks? They're going to get destroyed. I think you saw that in the Russell 2000 chart. It's, you know, it's looking at a 50% correction already. Um, like I mentioned last night, what's going to happen to small business? They don't have, you know, they don't have the staying power. Uh, you know, the Russell, that's, that's why you're seeing the Russell 2000 getting slaughtered right now. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting bad. For the past decade, most funds have been flat. That means that, if you had left your money with them since 2000, you'd have nothing to show for it. And adjusted for inflation, you'd be down 30%. You mean against inflation I've lost money? Then how will I save enough money for my retirement? If you are trusting in those crooks and pinstriped bandits on Wall Street, you will likely be left with nothing. Then what should I invest in? Well, you could invest in hard assets like gold and silver, which are a hedge against inflation. Over the same time period that stocks have lost money against inflation, silver is up over 700%. Is there a gold and silver mutual fund I can put my money in? No. And even if there were, it would still just be a piece of paper that can be declared worthless overnight. You need to get physical gold and silver in your hot little hand. But to do that I will need to cash out my 401k. And to do that I would have to quit my job. Correct. Now do you see how the Wall Street crooks and banksters operate? You are getting quite an education. But I'll give you a trick. What is that? If you can quit your job and get that money right now, do it. Don't worry about the 10% penalty. And if you can't quit, put all your 401k money in the safest option, short-term treasuries, and then borrow half of that money from yourself. I am allowed to borrow from my 401k. Yes, you can. I don't expect that to stay around. Uh, who knows what rules they're going to change. Um, I, I think the pensions, the annuities... The retirements, the stock accounts, I, I don't own a single share of stock. I haven't owned any stock uh, in a long time. I have some minor accounts that have some interesting bets, but I don't own any stock. But uh, yeah, I don't know. These things are going to be locked up. I, I, I don't even think you can borrow against them anymore. Once you've borrowed that money, go out and buy physical silver and gold to protect yourself from the hyperinflation that is coming. Thank you. I will do that today. Excellent. Goodbye. So, so what do people do when stuff gets evaporated? Uh, I don't know. Ignore it. Tune in something else. Hope that it comes back. We know that uh, the way markets work is greed and fear and hope. Uh, greed comes in up here. 
fear starts right here, but hope is the thing that kills you. Because it always comes back, right? Until it doesn't. And, uh, you know, that hope that uh, it's going to bounce back. That's what Jesse Livermore said about bear markets. He said, because Jesse Livermore was not just a, a, a trader. He ended up being recruited by a lot of big players because he was so such an expert at distributing stock because back in the day they would uh, have what we call today IPOs, but they would have distributions of stock. And uh, they, they'd have to be marketed just like they marketed Facebook or Twitter or whatever the, the, this stuff they want to roll out. They did it back in the day. And if you wanted to do it back in that day, you'd get just Jesse Livermore. And... Uh, Sometimes when a bear market was coming, the insiders would come to him to get him to uh, get rid of their stock before the bear hit. Oh, yeah, we just saw that. Sound familiar? Yeah. Uh, all these CEOs uh, borrowing money, buying stock, issuing themselves stock options, cashing out, quitting, cashing out, selling their stock, and leaving the company holding the bag. Yeah, how many times have we see that? I can't even count. So, but back in Livermore's day... Um, they would hire Jesse to unload their stock and they'd have to pool it together because if they all sold it once, it crashed the price. And Jesse had to generate a market to sell into. And one comment that he made when he was selling into these bear markets was that it is absolutely astounding the amount of stock that you can unload in a bear market. You can see that right here in the volume. In other words, that's the hope. This buy the dip all the way down they're catching the falling knife and if we're talking about a 90 or 95 percent bear market which we very well could be talking about um, we're talking about people getting slaughtered because they're going to be buying it all the way down and they're gonna, and then it's going to be dead on the ground for years and years just like the great depression just where even the greatest trader of all time, Jesse Livermore, he took his own life. Think about that one. We'll talk to you next time.